My name is Andrew Sullivan. I work for Dyne. I'm a principal architect there. Uh, that's a new title. When I sent this in, I was director of DNS engineering or something like that. So it, it's, it's the same Andrew Sullivan, just the title has changed. Uh, this year I was also appointed to the Internet Architecture Board and um, uh, as a result of this I've been thinking a lot about um, architecture and how things scale, but I'm interested primarily in internet protocols. And so you might wonder, well, why is this guy here talking to us if he's interested in internet protocols uh, when we want to talk about applications and organizations? Well, I figure that actually there's something in common about these. So the internet has scaled pretty well, uh, I think we can say, and I think we should learn from that. And fortunately, there are these people who have from time to time thought about this, and they thought about uh, what has worked for internet protocols. Also, um, some of you who know me will know that I was in a former life a philosophy student, and uh, I think that analogies are the best thing in the world, so I tend to uh, make a lot of analogies. And I think actually there are really powerful analogies uh, between uh, what has worked well for the internet as a whole and what you can um, do in the scale that you're working at. Now, I should make a disclaimer. Uh, people get very grouchy about the Internet Architecture Board, um, so I'm talking about an IAB document, but I was not on the IAB when it was published, and also I don't speak for them, uh, and so, you know, please don't write down anywhere, this guy from the IAB said something, because the IAB didn't say anything at all, they'll yell at me. I hate it when they yell at me. So, what am I talking about? I'm, I'm talking about a document that was published a number of years ago. Uh, it's RFC 5218, and if you don't know what an RFC is, uh, it's a request for comment series of documents. They're published, among other things, um, the internet standards are written that way, but also there are other kinds of things that are published as RFCs, and one of them are these kind of informational documents. This one is called What Makes for a Successful Protocol, and it has a bunch of distinctions that it likes to make, and I think distinctions are a good thing, so we're gonna go through some of them. So there's this idea of success. What is success in a protocol? And the way that the document, RFC 5218, the way it talks about it is that the protocol meets its original goals, that it's widely deployed, but widely deployed has a special meaning. It doesn't mean like it's all over the internet. It might be inside a domain or it might be everywhere on the internet. It sort of depends on what the original goal of the protocol was. So you know, this makes some sense. Obviously success is in terms of what you originally intended. Then they come up with this other idea of wild success. And wild success, you would think, is what you actually want, right? You want to be wildly successful. In, in the uh, 5218, the way wild success is defined is, first of all, in terms of exceeding the original goals in terms of the purpose, or in terms of scales. So you've got really two, um, uh, two ways that you can be wildly successful. And of course, you can do both of these at once. Um, and just for the record, we also have an idea of what failure is, so there's no mainstream implementations, um, there's no deployment, or there's no use. Uh, these aren't very interesting for our purposes, of course, because none of us are going to fail at anything, right? Therefore, I'm going to skip over all of this. All right, so I've got these two dimensions. I've got scale on the one side, and I've got purpose on the bottom. And if I want to have basic success, I just meet it, right? I, I cover the, the scale, I cover the purposes, and everything's good. Now, this is actually a pretty good uh, kind of arrangement because, of course, if you've set your targeted scale correctly and you've set your targeted purpose correctly, you, you know, you're going to be a success and, you know, in, in terms of a company, for instance, this is a way to make profit. Um, that is, you obviously set up your purpose and your scale such that you were going to make money in the first place, right? Nobody ever created a business plan that, you know, had bad ideas about that. So um, instead what you do is you have this, uh, this success, you've covered all of your areas and now you're good. But the thing about success is that it often doesn't follow your plan. So for instance, you can be successful by scaling quite a bit larger than you intended, while at the same time not covering the entire purpose. So an example that's used in, uh, in this RFC is uh, ARP. Um, uh, and those of you who don't know what an ARP is, it's a low-level protocol that happens on, the, uh, on a network where different machines talk to each other to tell them, here I am. Uh, and uh, so ARP, ARP was originally designed actually to, to be all over the internet, and it turns out that it doesn't really work that way. You typically don't use it in that, you know, in, in that application. Instead, it's used very, very heavily on local networks, um, but it's used at much larger scale than anybody sort of expected um, when it was originally designed. So this is a successful protocol because it, its scale is much larger, even though its original purpose is not totally covered. But then we've got wild success. 
So the idea of wild success is that you can scale, uh, you, you, you can you know, succeed at, at tremendous scale, and also you can succeed uh, across different purposes. And notice that in this case, the scale is not only above the original um, uh, scaling target, but it's also below. Uh, this is actually a tricky problem about scaling, right? That sometimes it's hard actually to scale downwards. Um, it, you know, you've got some sort of minimum level at which you have to perform, and if you can't, if you can't perform below that, then you deploy into these areas where it turns out it's much more expensive to operate than you expected. A good example of this is sensor networks. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, mobile devices or any kinds of things like that where the power requirements are, are quite a bit lower. And if you, um, you know, designed for scale where everybody had access to reliable power in a, in a plug, you've got a real problem if it turns out that you're deployed all over the place on these, uh, on these low power things. Um, that might be a purpose, might be a scale, it doesn't really matter. Uh, similarly, you can cover the purpose in, in, uh, much more wide, widely. So um, HTTP is actually a really good example here. Um, the original hypertext transfer protocol was intended really just to, you know, give you web pages. The, the idea was that we'd send you this um, thing and you'd, uh, you know, you could display it in your screen. But what actually happened is that HTTP got used for all kinds of other stuff. Um, uh, the joke, of course, among internet um, uh, protocol people these days is that the entire internet runs over HTTP, um, right? We're tunneling everything over HTTP. So you've got uh, NAT traversal is happening over, uh, over HTTP on the one hand. We've got web services running over HTTP on the other hand. Neither of these were things that were really envisioned when HTTP was defined. So this is an example of, of using, the, using something for purposes far beyond what, uh, was originally, uh, what was originally expected. So that's what wild success is all about. Now, this is obviously good, right? This is the kind of thing you want. Um, just imagine if you went into your boss one day and you said, wow, look at this, we've had massive success, this thing is scaled all over the world, everybody's using it, and on top of it all, it's doing all kinds of things. It does your laundry and also it makes us money. Um, that was, you know, that's the kind of thing that you want. But actually it turns out that this, I think, is none too shabby. And I'm gonna try to argue today that this is the kind of thing that is a success that is often one of your um, intermediate goals. You want to make sure that you can scale really tremendously in a narrow area because there, it turns out, are costs involved with having really wild success. So if you have really wild success, it's true, you know, you're really super successful, everybody in the world knows who you are, you have taken over the universe, um, you are, you know, printing money, blah, blah, blah. However, you've got some problems. The first problem is that frequently your original design actually doesn't achieve all of the things that people have started to use it for. So uh, you can think about um, HTTP, for instance, to come back to the example we started with. Uh, the original design of HTTP had all sorts of problems uh, when you think about how people have started to deploy that. Um, it wasn't really appropriate for NAT traversal, for instance, because you know each packet essentially had to start up again. And so you had uh, th this reuse of the protocol actually can cause problems for you because you've got this original design, but now you've got this wild success. People have deployed this all over the place and suddenly you're stuck with whatever original compromises you made. So you don't have the ability to change. Frequently, these original design problems have to do with performance. The thing is not really designed to perform at the scale that you want it to, given the new um, things that people want to do. So you've got this, um, the, the scaling thing on the left-hand side of our graph, and uh, what happens is people are trying to um, squeeze out of this thing performance that never was uh, intended to be there. Uh, the original HTTP specification, for instance, was a good example of this, and we had to make some changes to HTTP in order to allow things not to have that sort of problem, right? You got the sort of early slow start, and you had all these problems having to do with um, huge number of sockets being open and so on. We fixed that in HTTP 1.1, which is what everybody in the world is using, but um, uh, it nevertheless caused us a number of problems. What you get, typically, when you, when you have... Um, uh, when you have this sort of wild success, what happens is people start to use um, uh, hacks inside the system in order to get around the limitations of the original deployment. Uh, now, my sort of main 
um, area of expertise is the DNS, and we're going to come to the DNS in a little more detail in a minute. But um, if you want to talk about a place where nasty hacks proliferate, right, what people do is they say, oh, I'm going to shove it in the DNS, and then they figure, well, how am I going to shove it in the DNS, and then immediately you end up with a nasty hack. Uh, this, is a, this is a really common pattern, however, in every protocol that you can think of. Um, uh, and, and I think that it's an important um, factor because, you know, every time you have one of those nasty hacks, if you're really having that wild success, you've got a deployed base and now you've got to live with them. Uh, finally, and this is a little bit of a different problem, if you have wild success in particular, of course if you're successful just in, in your own terms, but especially if you have wild success, you become a really valuable target. And valuable targets um, uh, have the you know, property that if, if the being a target wasn't part of your original thinking, uh, you're going to have a problem. All right, so the RFC also makes uh, some observations about what makes for success and what makes for wild success. So I'm going to talk about these as well. I swear this will not entirely be an overview of this document by the time I'm done, but I, I want to make sure that everybody ha has this uh, base stuff first. Uh, so if you've read the RFC, I'm sorry, um, you know, give me a few minutes. Um, the first thing um, that success, uh, that, that's important to success, and it really is the first one, is that the protocol meets a need. If you, you know, if you create a protocol and people don't have that problem already, uh, then you, you're not going to go anywhere. Um, years and years ago, I saw Alan Cox um, give a talk uh, about open source software, and he said, in the open source world, the software is always late because it's always scratching an itch that somebody already has. Well, it turns out, actually, this is true of internet protocols as well. If you don't already have the problem, nobody's going to work on your protocol. Nobody's going to adopt it. So it's got to be something that people already need now. Secondly, and I don't know if it's just as important or almost as important, is that the thing be incrementally deployable. If, if, you, if everybody in the whole world has to implement this thing at the same time, it is never going to happen. Because what happens with, uh, you know, those sort of big uh, upgrades that everybody uh, wants to do all the time is inevitably somebody doesn't do it and then you've got to put a hack in there in order to make the old protocol work and then everybody looks at it and they say, wait a minute, this thing requires that I support this old thing anyway, so I'm just going to do the old thing. And I, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but, you know, where you add something to your, um, uh, to your, fe uh, to your feature list or whatever, and you think this is the best thing in the world and all that has to happen is everybody has to start using it and obviously everybody's going to start using it because it meets a need. Well, it doesn't meet everybody's need. And so if it's not incrementally deployable, you're going to have a problem. Now, a couple more uh, factors that have been important on the internet uh, is the existence of open code and uh, a protocol that doesn't have a lot of usage restrictions. And these sort of go together, right? They're, they're kind of linked. Um, but the key thing is that the open code, it's not, it's not the most important thing, but it's highly important because Frequently what people will do if they want to build something, they look at what somebody else has done. How many of you have done this? Okay, the rest of you are lying. Um, um, <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, I don't know, maybe I'm just especially stupid, but I, I, can't, I, I can't actually understand what I'm supposed to do without looking at examples. And so typically, the existence of open code is really useful for the success of a protocol because people who want to implement it have to look at how somebody else did it. Um, if you've spent a lot of time reading RFCs, um, the truth of the matter is they're not always totally clear what it is you're supposed to do. I know we're not supposed to say that, but it's, it's the case. Um, similarly, the usage restrictions can be a real issue because um, if, you know, what you've got to do is you've got to go and get permission from, you know, big giant corp um, to, uh, to deploy this thing in your own software, then the truth of the matter is you're just not going to do it because that's a risk, it's a business risk to you, you're just never going to do it. There are a couple of other things that have traditionally been important, but they're maybe less important. The first is that you've got an open specification. So you don't have to join, you know, special industry consortium in order to read the specification. Um, this has uh, historically been important later in the life of a protocol and less important in the early life of a protocol. Similarly, the maintenance of the protocol um, can be important. That is, if people know how the, um, how the maintenance procedure works, then in fact people are more likely to uh, adopt it, whereas if it's, you know, um, people in a smoky back room somewhere, a lot of the time people are uncomfortable with that protocol because they think, oh well, you know, who knows what's going to happen to us. Maybe what they're going to do is they're going to add in version 2 and also Bob's corporation can't have it. Um, and that could be added to the protocol and now you'd really be screwed so you're not going to build your um, business around that. Uh, finally, and it's interesting that this is last in the list, right? It has to be good technology to begin with. 
Um, but actually, if you think about the number of cases where software has failed or protocols have failed um, in, in the face of competition from something that is clearly much, much worse, um, the good technology um, uh, piece is not always that important. Uh, compared to the other things, having good technology is, is really, really unimportant. So if you've got an inversion, for instance, you've got something that is really, really cool, but everybody in the world has to update at the same time, not going to happen. So there are these additional wild success factors as well. Um, in order to be wildly successful, first of all, it seems that most protocols need to be extensible. You need to be able to add stuff to it because the chances that you figured out in advance uh, what it was that was going to be necessary for every possible use of this are very low. Uh, this is particularly true in the case of wild success where the purpose is wider than you expected, but of course scaling also requires extensibility. <clears throat> now you need to have no hard scalability bound and you would think that that is self-evident given that you know one of the ways you have wild success is uh, that you end up with uh, massive scaling. But um, it's astonishing how frequently people think that this is something that isn't a big deal. Well, yeah, we've got a hard scalability bound in there, but we'll just add 32 more of them and it'll all just work. And now you've got a different scaling problem, right? You've got coordination instead. Uh, finally, the, the threats to your protocol are actually an important thing, and you need to think about those. I already mentioned this. Um, you need to think about those, especially if you're going to have wild success. So by now you're all bored because I'm talking about uh, internet protocols and who cares, but I claim uh, that these are patterns um, that are useful in applications and in organizations too. So even organizations can benefit from this thing. So the first thing, of course, is meeting a need. Uh, everything that I've seen in my increasingly long career on the internet uh, uh, suggests to me that um, stuff that isn't already desired by people is just not going to go anywhere unless you don't care. Right? You can have something sitting around for a long time, but the truth is you won't get any buzz. I think that's sort of self-evident. The incremental deployability, however, is something that a lot of people don't think about. I frequently encounter people who say, oh, and in version two, we'll just send a packet and we'll get everybody to upgrade. You see this a lot in the app world, right? Um, you get things and they say, oh, this one is deprecated, now go and do that one. Um, but the fact of the matter is your users are never going to do that. If, if there isn't something in the new thing that is so valuable to them that they've got to change, what that means is you're asking them to change their use patterns. You're asking them to change their own habits in order to make your life easier. What is in that for them? Nothing. So they're not going to do it. Finally, you notice I skipped open code, of course, in a lot of cases open code is just fine. But usage restrictions are uh, a real issue. And in particular, they need to be unimportant usage restrictions if you're going to have them. If it meets a need and it's incrementally deployable and you've got some usage restriction that annoys people, well, it might annoy them, but it's not that big a deal. But if you've got stuff that really gets in the way of their use of the thing, then that's an important usage restriction and it's going to fail. Now, you'd think, obviously, these, uh, these ones don't have to be mentioned, but once again, I want to emphasize that if you haven't thought about the, uh, uh, the threats to your uh, system, then when you get to wild success, you're going to have a really bad day. So think about those things early. For organizations, actually, there's a similar um, sort of parallel here. And right now, I'm thinking in particular about inside the organization. I've worked in um, several different um, technical environments, and um, these are all my personal complaints. So you know, I'm going to air them here publicly so you can all be amused. Um, the first thing is that in organizations, you know, when you've got a procedure or some sort of piece of the structure of the organization that you want to set up, um, it's often not totally clear what need that is meeting. And so if you're, if you're faced with this problem, particularly as you scale the organization, it's tempting to like, you know, add new departments or something like that. You need to have a very clear idea of what problem it is you're trying to solve before you start doing the organ uh, making those changes to the organization. If you don't do this, then at some point or other, somebody's going to look around and they're going to say, what are those guys doing over there at the other end of the building? So you need to have that kind of meeting a need, and that meeting a need needs to be something that everybody can understand, or it's not going to solve a problem. Oddly, you need to be able to do this in an incrementally deployable way, too. Um, from time to time, organizations like to go through these things where they do complete restructurings of everything. And having been through a couple of complete restructurings of companies, I've got to say this is one of the worst things you can possibly do because everybody's productivity stops for like you know a month while you figure out, oh, gee, well, what is it that we're going to do? If, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes it's just a painful thing and you've got to go through it. But most of the time, 
if you can make changes gradually and over time and you can sort of morph things, that is a really valuable thing to do for your organization. Finally, it would seem that these two items are kind of bizarre. What do they have to do with organizations? But I want to suggest that if everybody can't understand what the purpose of something inside the organization is, then you're going to have people who are particularly uncomfortable. And this is especially true in engineering organizations. If you've got a highly technical organization and you've got people who you know, are naturally hackers and they want to figure out what, how things work and they want to take it apart and everything like that, then if you have some magical thing that goes off into legal and then six months later stuff comes out of there, that is just a black box. And what you're going to have are people inside the company who are spending all of their time trying to figure out how can I hack around the black box? And you'll spend a lot of time um, with usage restrictions and so on inside the company that are frustrating to you. So these are um, factors for the organization. Finally, in small organizations, for wild success, this is a really important one and one that frequently people can't get over. Small companies that start off with, you know, four people in a garage and then, you know, a little while later turn out to be five or six hundred people often have the problem that there are two or three people from the early days of the organization and they have to sign off on everything. And very quickly, you will run into the case so I know I'm probably pre preaching to the choir here because I think the organization people are somewhere else. But um, you will get to the point where, um, uh, where you will run into some day where two people are on vacation and nothing can happen that day and it's the most important deal ever and now like, you know, giant corp has just walked away as a customer. Just don't do this. You need to distribute the authority throughout the organization. Okay, so I promised that I would talk about real concrete examples in an effort to um, sort of convince you that this um, uh, stuff that I'm saying here is not total nonsense. And I should say, by the way, this is the first time I've tried these things out in public, so if you think it's total nonsense, you should, you know, just tell me, so I'd be interested to hear that too. Uh, all right, so the first example that I'm going to use is, uh, is the DNS. Um, the DNS is interesting to me partly because of its um, distribution. It's got two ways. It's one of the most successful, I would argue, it's the most successful distributed database that's ever been deployed anywhere in the world. Uh, and um, something that people forget about the DNS is how old it is. When the DNS was initially designed, we didn't use TCP IP on the internet yet. That's how old the DNS is. So this is, a, this is as old as you can get on the internet and still be on the internet. And yet, this thing has worked and it has scaled right up, so we're running all these billions of things all over the world, and we've managed to add all kinds of stuff to it, and it's still working. And it's working remarkably well, given its limitations, though there are some problems. So the first way that it's distributed is that it's distributed in terms of its authority. Who controls which piece of data? That's distributed all over the internet. And what that means is, that, of course, there's no central point of coordination where everything has to check into a single place. The second way that it is distributed has to do with, the, with who has the data at any one time. So despite the fact that the authority um, resides in particular places on the internet, the data is distributed all over the place because of caches, right? This is your intermediate resolver, that thing in the middle uh, is an intermediate resolver. So you've got points out at the end, they make queries, but they typically don't make queries to the authority servers who are at the top. Instead, they make queries to an intermediate resolver and that resolver does the work on behalf and then caches it, so if somebody else comes along and asks for, uh, for that same data, they can uh, hand it out again. Uh, of course, with short TTLs, we are gradually chipping away at this, but never mind that, I'm gonna pretend that that isn't happening. Now, the DNS has some really weird properties to it, and things that, if you've got a sort of classical um, application design uh, education, look like a bad idea. And the first is that there is no separation in the DNS between the control channel and the data channel. So metadata about the protocol is carried in band as more data. And the obvious example of this is the SOA record, which is the start of authority, which actually tells you the boundaries of zones in the DNS, and yet that's just another piece of data in there. Um, it's a crazy idea, and you would think, you know, oh, well, we should separate the control data, and then we could actually control the system without, uh, without impinging on the, um, uh, on the data itself. I used to believe that, and I have come to believe that one of the biggest strengths that the DNS has had is the fact that all of its control data is right in band. So, you know, despite the lessons that, you know, the Bell system learned from in-band communication, it seems to me that, um, uh, that the advantage that comes from having this, uh, th this ability to just add control data to it is that it turns out if you want to add a new kind of, of feature to the DNS, it's just another kind of data. 
You can just add it in there. And this is a, a nice feature that some of, the, um, some of the current distributed database systems have actually adopted and they've really embraced this, but others have actually headed in the other direction. They're avoiding that. And it, it, I, I've come to believe that this is actually one of the key pieces to the scalability of the DNS, that we've, because we have this in-band control channel, if we want to add something new, we can just add it as a new kind of data. The most obvious example to the, of this, of course, is DNSSEC, where it's just more data in the, um, uh, in the system, and it actually turns out that that has been deployable, although maybe not as deployed as we would like. Another thing about the DNS is that it was supposed to be strongly typed data. Um, and yes, I did fool with the picture before I put this up here. Um, uh, the, um, uh, this is, by the way, available from Cafe Press. You can get t-shirts and all, uh, all kinds of things um, with it. This is a, a real product available on the internet. Um, we were supposed to have strongly typed data um, uh, in the DNS, right? So we have, we have SOAs and we have uh, A records, which have IPv4 um, addresses in their, in their payload. Uh, we have quad A's, which uh, have IPv6. Um, we have uh, uh, TXT records, which are supposed to be unstructured um, text data. We have uh, uh, PTR records, which are supposed to be pointers, and so on. But it turned out that that original list was in an RFC, and a lot of people think, well, it's an RFC, so it must be a standard. And so they, um, uh, they implemented that list, and they figured that was the static list for all time, and it was never going to go away. It turned out then that adding new data to the DNS was hard. So what everybody does is they say, well, there's this TXT data there. TXT is like unstructured. I get to put whatever I want in there. And very quickly, we started to discover that people standardized these things. They would, they would put stuff in a TXT record, and it's just some random blob of, of text in there. But having put that in there, then they say, oh, well, query it with this special name. If it's got this special name, then it's got these semantics and so on. So TXT is supposed to have no semantics, except that it has semantics whenever I say so. This is a very, very common thing we see in the DNS. It's all over the place. Uh, and people do this both in a coordinated fashion. For instance, they do it by publishing the, this domain key name that I've got there on the right-hand side is the DKIM me uh, mechanism. Uh, so that's, a, that's an, uh, an IETF uh, standard. Other people just use this, right? Everybody who's ever set up a Google um, service of any kind, what, what do they tell? They, they tell you, oh, put this TXT record at the apex of your zone. And what that is, and Microsoft does this too, lots of people do it, uh, what that is is a little key to tell them, oh, no, no, this person really is in charge of that domain. And, and the pr reason for that, of course, is that there's no other way on the internet to, to, to ensure that. So they're looking to make sure that you really can make those changes to the domain. The surest way to show that is to show, oh, well, they can, they can edit the zone file. So this is a very common uh, feature. We've extended this data type and subtyped it. All right, there's a, another thing that I think is really interesting about the DNS, and that is that there's supposed to be this control point, right? You're supposed to have this, uh, this recursive resolver, and everybody's supposed to use it because that makes caches better. But the fact of the matter is the DNS design really enables people to go around that if they want to. If I don't like that my ISP is screwing with the results um, when, when I query for them because they want to you know, send me off to adware or they think that HTTP is the entire internet or whatever, um, then I can just go around them and I can do all of the queries myself. And remember, this early thing that I said about the design of the DNS, that is, it's all just data, it has a corresponding uh, thing about the, the participants in the DNS. We normally think of the DNS as, you know, clients who are looking these things up and the DNS servers. But as a matter of fact, the design of the DNS is sort of cool in that they're all just messages. And they've just got a bit in them that says, oh, this is a query or a response. So, so a nice thing about it is that, it, you know, it's sort of trivial to go around things. Now, of course, if you're, you know, big, giant, security, national institute guy, um, then maybe you think that this is a problem. But everybody else on the internet thinks it's great. So um, this is a, another, another feature of the way the DNS has worked. And it makes it scale well. Because of these properties, it turns out to be really easy to do incremental deployment of stuff in the DNS. For instance, over here in, in .com, they can you know, add some kind of feature to .com, like they can add support for certain kinds of zones. They could add support, for instance, for DNSSEC, uh, and they can do that without actually coordinating with everybody else on the internet. This is something that they can do independently because it's their area, um, it, it's a name space that they control. 
So this is a cool thing about the DNS, and um, here at crankyconnect.ca, I can do this at home. This is me at home. Um, I, I can, I can uh, do things only in my own zone, and I can share that with my friends or whatever, and I don't have to worry about anybody else. So it's, it's a tradition of permissionless innovation that is really well expressed in the DNS. It's something that, you know, because it's so widely distributed, anybody can play. All right, so there are a few lessons here. The first is that this tradition of all just data everything's just more data in the DNS, turns out to give a great deal of flexibility. The distribution of authority makes for a really scalable system, so you don't actually have to have a, uh, you know, a central place that you've got to check this data in. Notice this distribution of authority thing is a really radical way in the DNS, right? Once I've delegated away a namespace, everything underneath that is somebody else's control, and I just don't have any control over it except to cut them off. The only control I have is to turn them off. A lot of the time when people talk in their applications about radical distribution of authority in this way, what they really mean is the data is everywhere and not the authority. There's a central check-in point, right? You've got a central master and then you distribute all the data everywhere. But that doesn't scale as well as you think it, it does. So you need to think about both of these kinds of, uh, kinds of cases. Um, also, the data subtyping stuff that I talked about with TXT, that turns out to be really ugly when you're designing a system. You think, oh God, no, please don't do that to me because I got to parse in two places and everything. But it turns out that as a, as a useful hack, it has turned out to scale really well. So that's an example of something that, you know, in your design, you would have thought, oh geez, this is going to suck. And it turns out, actually, it will work. Organizations actually can learn the same kinds of stuff from this. So once again, distributing authority scales well. You don't have that single point of failure. Well, then give people the right to you know, do the right thing. Um, distributing clue is also another key, uh, key part of this, though. Because of the way the DNS works, everybody can uh, you know, participate sort of uh, you know, similarly. They, they're all using the same kinds of messages. Well, if what you've got is a radical sort of management techie separation in your organization, inevitably you end up with these stupid battles where you get turf wars and all the, all the rest of that kind of thing. So if you can distribute that clue around so that everybody can talk the same kind of message, it's really helpful. Hard to do, especially as you grow really big, because there's a natural tendency to specialization. But this is where those kind of organizational values, um, common uh, organizational values come in. Uh, finally, if you think that you can choke um, information by closing down the communication paths, forget about it. I think this is a key lesson, actually. Uh, the, on the internet, you are so not in control for every value of you. And this is a, this is a really valuable insight. I didn't make that up, by the way. It's uh, Phil Helen Baker um, uh, made that up, and it's one of the cleverest things I've ever heard him say. Um, uh, so this is, a, this is a key feature of the internet, that people can just go around it, and I think that this is an important thing for your organization. This is not just a diagram about um, you know, people looking up things in the DNS, this is also a diagram about people gossiping in the lunchroom. All right, so I wanna move away from DNS because we don't wanna talk about that all day. Um, so in the era of Facebook and Twitter, I keep wondering, why does everybody still have an inter uh, why does everybody still have an email address? Right? I mean, email is really hard to use because of all the spam and everything like that, and yet everybody has to have one. Now, one reason for this, of course, is that it's a bootstrap mechanism. Uh, it's a bootstrap mechanism because if you want to recover your password, for instance, you're going to use this email address, which is supposed to be, um, you know, the original one. Uh, and we're, we've, we're gradually taking this to the most absurd extremes where when you sign up for one, you know, free email system, what they do is they ask you for an email address where they can mail you a recovery um, me method later. Uh, I don't know, it's turtles all the way down or something. But, um, uh, you know, at some point, um, we've still got this universality. Well, uh-oh. Oh, excellent. PowerPoint has just died. Give me a sec. Somewhere down here. Um, this reminds me of uh, the Unix haters handbook. It's great that it starts up so fast. I think I'm showing my age there. All right, so the first thing about uh, SMTP um, uh, that has allowed it to continue to scale in an era when uh, you know, a, a lot of its utility is diminished is that it turns out it, it is extensible and it was designed to be extensible 
Uh, it wasn't originally designed to be extensible, but it turned out that extensibility was really easy to add to it. And this is because there's a negotiation phase at the beginning, right, when you're communicating. On you go. So here is this negotiation phase. When, when SMTP, when it got extensions, uh, it, they changed the hello to EHLO, um, or however you pronounce that. Uh, and, and then you get this, uh, this negotiation back from the other end of the communication where it says, oh, and here are my capabilities. Uh, there are two things that have happened with SMTP to make this extensibility valuable. First of all, it is extensible. And secondly, um, the mail people are all, they're not as bad as DNS people, but they're, they're all get off my lawn kind of guys. So every time, um, every time somebody comes along with a new extension, oh, we'll just add this, um, the answer from most of the um, mail people is, you can already do that, go away. The reason I think that's valuable is because it turns out that extensibility is a, an attractive nuisance. Right? It, it allows you to, um, uh, to um, add all these features, but if you add too many features, of course, what you've got is a big bloated protocol that doesn't work very well. Nevertheless, we do use these extensions, um, and we use them uh, when necessary. One has just happened this year, for instance, where we added uh, internationalization to, uh, to SMTP. So now you'll be able to get spam in email addresses that you can't read. SMTP has another uh, uh, factor that, uh, that has been important for its wild success. Um, despite the incredible scaling of all of those other communication programs, SMTP uses the, um, the, the distributed nature of the, uh, of the DNS uh, in order to you know, define the mail, uh, the mail domains, and it turns out that this is a really scalable system. So it's true, actually, that the, um, the largest mail um, systems on the internet are enormous, and they're, they're overwhelmingly the hugest uh, providers, but there's an incredibly long tail. And what this means is that the, um, the SMTP uh, scales really well. However, there is an argument to be made that maybe the threats were not sufficiently mitigated, and this is how we got the spam problem. Uh, now, keep in mind that they were sufficiently mitigated when SMTP was created because SMTP was also created back in the day when, like, everybody on the Internet knew each other. Um, back when SMTP was originally uh, uh, designed, for instance, you could get a book, a mimeographed book of all of the names and addresses of the people connected to the Internet. So in that kind of environment, the threat model, right, is, oh, well, you're a jerk. I'm going to call you up and tell you off. Uh, and at that point, um, you know, you can see that's a pretty good um, threat mitigation strategy. And it just turns out that when you connect two billion people to it, it doesn't work that well. And so this, was, this is a, an example of the wild success really coming back and biting, uh, biting you because, you know, you didn't have the ability to um, cope with that. Two other things that were really important for SMTP, there was the open specification and the open maintenance. Um, there's strong reason to believe that the other competing messaging systems back in the early period uh, did, not conf uh, did not have these features, and that was the reason people picked SMTP over some of the alternatives. It was simple enough that you could do it, and you could understand it, and you could actually get hold of the specification, whereas some of the messaging systems were entirely proprietary. And so if you wanted to uh, use that messaging system, you had to pay those guys. Uh, this has some interesting uh, implications, I think, for some of the closed um, uh, systems right now, and I think that some of those people should maybe think about that. So one lesson here, you have to meet the right need. It turned out that SMTP took off on the Internet even though nobody had thought of it. Originally, email ran on top of FTP because email was not part of the original design goal on the Internet. Um, you have to think about the threats from the beginning, however, the failure to do that is why we have the spam problem today. Arguably, you can't actually run an open uh, messaging system and, you know, mitigate this threat because it turns out you've always got free riders. Hard to know, but I don't want to get into that right now. Finally, you need to be able to plan to change your plan. The SMTP guys really did a good job, the, the people who designed this protocol really did a good job of saying, hey, we need to be, make some extensibility in here, let's add it. Finally, I want to talk about NAT. NAT is actually not widely standardized on the internet uh, because there are several different versions of it and it's got all kinds of nastiness. Um, you remember that the reason we ha had NAT in the old days is that we, you know, in, in the really old days you just connected to the internet, you wanted to connect to your computer, you can tell this is the old days because it's got like a CRT, right? Um, uh, and that's, and that's an FTP server over on the right. Um, uh, and so you were connected directly to the internet. But it turned out there were only four billion addresses and they were not distributed very efficiently. So there were these classes. We were running out of room and the next generation of IP, which eventually became IPv6, um, it wasn't ready. So what do we do? We're gonna share. 
Uh, I don't know if this diagram is big enough, but anyway. Um, you can see over there on the left, you all know that this is a NAT box, and it talks uh, to two networks. It talks out, outbound on 192.0.2.3 in this case, uh, and then inbound it talks on one of the RFC 1918 addresses, the 192.168.0 network. Um, and it talks to these individual things in there, and the way this works literally is that the NAT box, you know, receives things on the in, inside address, and it translates the, the address to the outside, and then it keeps in mind, you know, what that address was in order to enable two-way communication. Not hugely complicated, but of course it um, has certain features. One of the features is that this can be sold as a security product. And as the internet grew, um, it turned out that adding security to the network was really important, even though NAT wasn't really doing the security here. This turned out to be use, useful as a stateful firewall. The other security feature, um, and I call this a security feature because at the time it was regarded as one, uh, is that it breaks a lot of things on, on there, which is really bad for the user of that thing, right? The user is unhappy, but if you're the network administrator, this is a feature, not a bug. Um, because what you can do is shut down things that you don't want people doing by just putting the NAT in the way, and it, it you know, makes a mess of it. Now, never mind that you didn't need a NAT for this. Um, the fact of the matter is that's how it often was sold. Now, I know we should have deployed IPv6, and don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of IPv6. You should all go and deploy it right now. It has way more space, it fixes other problems, it allows end-to-end -end connectivity once again, so we get you know, back to that old, old thing where you can do peering really easily, for instance, as opposed to you know, three layers of NAT traversal. It'll do your laundry, it'll make you coffee in the morning, it's great. Um, but one of the main things about IPv6 that turned out to be a problem was that it made everybody upgrade their systems all at once. Essentially, in order to be useful, if I want to use IPv6, all of the network equipment in the way needs to um, upgrade to IPv6, and also all of the people I want to talk to have to upgrade to IPv6. This is not incremental deployment. So, we ended up with NAT and IPv4 everywhere. If you're staying in this hotel, you are using NAT in your room. Um, so NATs have scaled really, really large. Um, they suck, but they scale really large. The NAT was available first, the costs were externalized to the users. If you're the network administrator who's making the decision, you don't care about those costs because your problem has gone away. Instead, all of your users are paying for it. It could be sold as a feature. I remember being, um, you know, working in small networks um, uh, back in the 90s, and, um, you know, NATs were sold over and over again as firewall devices that just happened to do network translation for you. Uh, it, it was, a, it was a, a, good, a good marketing move. But the most important thing, connectivity was the most important piece here. And since that was the killer feature, and it was what was being enabled, as opposed to, you know, Mr. Network Administrator, please upgrade all of your equipment and deploy for 10 years, and then we will have a new solution, uh, NAT was the obvious choice. So re remember those success factors. You've got to meet a need, and you've got to meet a need that people already have. Needs to be incrementally deployable. Those were the two big things for, uh, for NAT. People will put up with almost any inconvenience in order to get their kill killer feature, if, that, if that's what their choice is. There was a stark choice on the internet. You couldn't have all of the IPv4 you wanted at home, for instance, because you couldn't afford it. So what are you going to do? You're going to put up a NAT box. If you distribute the problem, you get a scalable system even if it doesn't work that well. That is, everybody had to deploy NAT, but everybody could deploy NAT at their own speed and so on and to their own level of competence, and so you just distributed the problem. By distributing the problem, you get a worse technical solution, but you get a solution. Also, you shouldn't underestimate inertia. Even to this day, we've got people who are requesting NAT 6.6. They want to NAT from one V6 to another V6, and the reason they want to do that is because security. And, you know, there's no security added by a NAT, but nevertheless, that's what we hear. So, um, so there's a lot of inertia there. It's just, you know, sort of intellectual inertia. All right. So I'm just about done. I think that RFC 5218 is a pretty good way to think about success outside of protocols, things that would be important for your, uh, for your company, things that would be important for your application. But not every factor in that RFC is relevant for, for scaling. Nevertheless, scaling on the network is, is really a species of just scaling generally. Ultimately, what you want to do is be able to say, oh, I'm going to have this kind of success, and remember that columnar uh, example that I had. Scaling really, really, wide, uh, really high is a good way to scale first. If you want to have wild success later, that's nice, but at least you get the scaling right first. 
I think the DNS is a good example of how decentralization can help, and it also illustrates this uh, flexibility with the data. That is, the, the, the blending of the control and data channel, I think, turns out to be a really valuable thing, even though it always makes me a little ill. Uh, SMTP has this extensibility thing, and I like, when I start to see a, a, new, uh, a new application being proposed, I like to see that kind of negotiation, even though it costs a little bit at the beginning. Uh, ideally, of course, what you want to do is have negotiation in band um, with your initial messages so you can, uh, you can do things quickly, which is the way SMTP has done it, right? You send that initial connection and you immediately get back, not just, oh, you've got the connection, but also here's all the stuff that I can do. Uh, so if you, can, if you can build that in, that's a really nice example because it allows you to scale to the future. Uh, but also, of course, if you don't mitigate your threats, then you're going to have problems in the future. Finally, NAT, I think, is a nice illustration of how the right answer is not always the right answer now. And I think that this is, a, this is something that, despite my distaste for NAT, it turns out that it has scaled really well, and we need, we need to embrace that and try to understand why. Um, and I think one of the key reasons is the critical feature is the critical feature. It's the thing you need to have. V6 and all of the proposals, well, with one exception, um, back in the IPNG days, um, didn't offer this one key feature, which is that it just worked with all of the stuff you already had. You didn't have to do anything magic. And that, that is just the, the most important thing, that incremental deployability, particularly in your applications. If you think that everybody's going to upgrade, think again. Uh, finally, also, it demonstrates that marketing can often be enough, right? A lot of NATs were successful despite the fact that they had a lot of technical limitations because the marketing behind them was, was good enough. So that's everything I had to say about this, and we've got uh, some time for questions or brickbats or whatever, if you would like. So for people who maybe didn't hear that, how important do I think the RFC vanguard, by which I guess you mean like people who are publishing new RFCs, um, uh, are for deploying and de developing new protocols? There are three answers to that, and one of them is, well, not at all, uh, and it never was. So um, this first answer really comes down to this deep feature of the internet, that it was about permissionless um, innovation that the ability to you know, deploy something in your network, your network, your rules, um, is, uh, it, it was always a feature and it was something that was always done. Uh, but there are two ways in which it's really important. The first is that um, despite the painful and unbelievable bureaucracy that is sometimes, um, you sometimes see at the IETF, uh, there really is an advantage to the kind of uh, review that you can get there that you typically cannot get anywhere else. Uh, because what you get from people who are there are people who, who have thought about uh, network scalability at a really big, um, uh, you know, in, in a really serious way. Um, and who've been around the block a few times. Uh, there was a very funny thing a few years ago when they were setting up a working group about um, sensor networks, essentially low power, um, uh, low power devices. And there was this um, quite young guy at the microphone saying, I don't think you people really understand how constrained these networks are. And standing behind him was a guy who'd worked on the original IMP project, which was, you know, like the, the really old days. And he said, I want you to understand the first machine I ever worked on had 8K. I understand what a constrained network is. And so he, he was, you know, grouchy about that. But, but there was a key lesson for me in that, and that is, here are people who understand techniques that are simply not taught anymore. Nobody knows how to do them, right? Really compact code is something that nobody who's worked with Python thinks of. Um, and um, <laughs> that's no dig against Python, it's just a fact. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, so I think that that's, that's one, uh, one important piece of it. And then secondly, uh, there remains in the IETF generally, although not in all parts of it, a really strong aversion to putting more smarts in the middle of the network. And um, if you're working heavily on application um, stuff, this is a big advantage um, because smart applications need to be smart at the edges, right? This is the key part of that distributing, um, 
distributing the authority. You need stuff to happen in the edges so that people can upgrade incrementally. And there have been a lot of proposals in recent, uh, you know, in recent years where I see people sort of trying to suck that information up into, the, up into the network. A lot of cloud stuff, for instance, really turns out to be an old-fashioned mainframe mentality. I'm going to do everything up here, and you're going, to be, you know, you're going to be a dumb client. And that's really useful until the day where you want to do something out there on the client, and you've got another client over here, and the cloud doesn't know anything about it. And if we gradually suck all of that intelligence into the middle, we're going to lose our ability to do this kind of innovation at the edge. So I think that there remains, um, there remains a value in, uh, in the work that goes on in these RFCs, primarily because you still have people who are doing that kind of review. Whether that will still be true in five or ten years, I can't say. Uh, on the other hand, if we want it to be true, then what we have to have are more people who are participating in that way. I can't actually see because there's like light shining in my eyes. So if there's another question, oh, yep. So, uh, but what's happening is various companies are kind of coming up with their own, uh, in particular, I'm talking about cloud video gaming in particular. Um, you, you, a lot of these cloud video ga gaming companies are coming up with their kind of own version of a cloud video gaming protocol and um, ra rather than kind of coming together and saying, okay, what's, what's the best way to kind of share a protocol and, and have intercompatibility? Um, do you think that's a necessary evil until the, the, com the best competitor wins out and then maybe that grow from there into a, a, a ETF standard or do you think we should be trying to uh, drive a standard sooner? So this really comes back to something that was uh, an early piece of uh, what we we're talking about today and I'm just going to go find it. Um, One of the things that we discover if we just look empirically at the success of some of these protocols is that open specification and open maintenance were success factors, but they were lesser success factors. Uh, what you've just described, actually, that things you know, got deployed and they were adopted you know, fairly widely, and only later did you really get uh, an open specification that really nailed things down. Um, and also, by the way, only later did you often get good technology. Frequently, the technology is much worse as a result. Uh, they, they turn out not to be they turn out not to be critical success factors right at the time of adoption, and I'm I'm unhappy about that because the fact of the matter is exactly what you just described is going to happen. Right, you're going to get proprietary protocols that later people decide, oh well, that really needs to be standardized so we can all use it in a sort of uh, consistent way. And uh, again, back in the era when a lot of these things were invented, uh, there weren't. Uh, there weren't the patent trolls everywhere. So, uh, you know, patent trolling is a relatively recent phenomenon, and, and so we didn't have the kind of intellectual property claims that we, we see a lot in, in a lot of ITF protocols these days. Um, so I'm, I'm, ex I'm especially nervous about, the, um, uh, about this tendency to try to develop a proprietary protocol and then later maybe we'll open it up because of the, of the sort of strong and uh, the strong claims that we see right now about you know, I have intellectual property over that, and so you need to pay me. Um, uh, so I worry about it, but at the same time, as a pragmatic, um, as a pragmatic fact about the, uh, about the development of most of these protocols, that's the way they worked anyway, right? People worked together on these things. Now, if you're asking me what I personally would prefer, um, I really strongly believe that you tend to get better protocols if you open them early and get better review. Um, while it's true that some of the fussier people around the IETF are just cranks and they get in your way, um, uh, there are advantages to getting that kind of early review so you can actually you know, move ahead with something that you can build on later. Um, the, the hard part about that is it's sort of painful to go and listen to a bunch of people who appear not to take seriously your business problem um, telling you, oh, well, you know, you need to do it this way. Uh, however, buried in all of that dreck, it turns out, are frequently really trenchant um, points about, you know, 
this is going to cause you scalability problems, and here are the 10 ways in which we've had that scalability problem before. You really want to think about it. And so that review is something that you get um, you know, by doing it early. And the problem is if you, if you wait until later, then you've got to actually figure out how you're going to fix your protocol, and you've got to have a version 2 or something. If you have thought about extensibility or if you've thought about you know, incremental deployability, then that's not such a problem. So as long as you've thought about those things and you're, um, you know, you're doing things in a, in a sort of closed way first, uh, then you can do the review later and you can actually make, uh, make these changes. But a lot of those proprietary protocols, what we see is that they haven't thought about that either. And so as soon as you've got this, um, this problem where you discover, oh, it's got a really serious hard scalability limit over here, now what you've got to do is come up with a completely new protocol to, um, uh, to replace it. And that's actually a hard deployment problem. Um, so one way of solving the deployment problem, especially in consumer applications, is it just auto-upgrade? And I think of Google Chrome as the preeminent example of where that's the case. Do you see a future where protocols and distributed systems are handled the same way? Um, so we see that actually uh, happening already, right? I mean, we, we do see examples where um, the answer has just been, well, we'll wait until everybody deploys. But whereas doing this um, at really edgy things like um, uh, like web browsers is relatively easy. If you look at your statistics, you will discover that um, you know you've got like an overwhelming majority up here in the 80 percent, and then you've got this 20 percent tail, uh, or sometimes it's smaller than that. Sometimes it's 10 or something like that. And the question you have to ask yourself is, well, how valuable is that tail, and how likely is it that I can convert them? If there's a human sitting at the other end and it's a single device, your chances of converting are reasonably high. If there's a server sitting at the other end, your chances of uh, converting them are approximately zero. Essentially, what you have to do is wait until they replace the machine. Um, uh, so there's a large number of machines out there that are just, you know, well, we've got to wait until these things are replaced. The best example of these are customer premises equipment, right? Those things that are sitting there, cable boxes or whatever. If you talk to people who are in the cable industry and you say, well, why don't you just, you know, get your users to upgrade this thing? They will tell you these nightmare stories about how they would go around and they would, you know, send people to the door and say, here is your new cable box. Will you please plug it in? And the answer was no, go away. You know, they've got like ancient Doxis modems sitting out there on cable networks, not because, you know, the cable companies don't want to replace them. It's a nightmare for them because it's constant customer support calls. What they want them to do is upgrade the box, but the answer is no. Leave me alone, I'm busy right now. So really what you have to ask yourself is where in this stack do you sit? And if you're sitting really close to a human, then your chances are reasonably good that you're gonna be able to do this. If you're sitting closer to the, the waist of the, of the hourglass, you know, where you get this, uh, this innovation, you've got like IP kind of in the middle, then your chances of, of um, you know, doing this kind of dynamic uh, upgrading all the time, unfortunately pretty low, and for that reason, it's ever more important to design in your ability of this incremental deployment. One other thing that I would say is that the browsers actually have been pretty good at incremental deployment, right? Really what, what Chrome and Mozilla and all the rest of them, this constant upgrade um, path, what that really amounts to is we're going to roll this thing out and we're gonna turn it on and then we're gonna make it available for people and they'll upgrade when they get around to it. If they're offline or whatever, they'll upgrade when they get around to it. That really is an incremental deployment path. Uh, and it's an impressive one, actually, at the scale that they're doing. And I have to say, I think they've done a good job thinking about it. Um, not all of the pieces have been, uh, you know, have, have been as successful as others, but by and large, I think they've done a good job. Alrighty, well, actually, we're out of time anyway, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the meeting.